Good afternoon, everyone. As Sarah said, I'm Eric Bustos, the board chair of the LBJ Future Forum. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, for our conversation post-election landscape in Texas and beyond. The Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss local, statewide, and national topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions, which is needed now perhaps more than ever. The Future Forum's events are made possible, though, by our credible members and sponsors, including the Downtown Austin Alliance, Jeff Eller Group, Carbach Brewing, and Joe Cook's Care. I'm incredibly excited to begin today's discussion, focusing on the recent elections and the political trends that we're seeing. Uh, joining us today is that Re State Representative Celia Israel, political writer for the Dallas Morning News, Gromer Jeffers, State Representative Matt Krauss, and the Washington Bureau Chief for the Texas Tribune, Abby Livingston. There will be an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the conversation. You're able to type your questions into the Q&A box throughout the conversation, and we'll address as many as we can at the end. And now I'll turn it over to our moderator, Karina Kling, host of Capital Tonight on Spectrum News to lead our discussion. Thank you and thanks for everyone for thanks to everyone for being here. Hopefully everyone's gotten some rest. I'm looking at all of the panelists <laughs> and addressing that to you guys right now because I know that that has not been the case for many of us. Um, just to kick things off and to be blunt, Representative Israel, I want to start with you. What happened to Texas Democrats? Well, um, I think Donald Trump had been to, de to Texas Democrats. Um, he's a, he, you know, he's he's been a difficult man to understand, a difficult president to understand, and he draws from a different kind of voter. And I think our polling, um, our our polling was wrong. Uh, it was wrong on both sides. I don't know about Matt, but I'm ready to take our pollsters and put them in a cannon and shoot them across Lake Travis. That's what I'm ready to do. <laughs> they were wrong. Uh, we thought we'd gain seats. Um, my Republican friends thought they would they would lose some seats, and neither of those scenarios happened. Like it was just status quo. So, um, you know, we've got to uh, pick up our pick up our bright spots where we can, dust ourselves off, and get ready for a very difficult session in January. Representative Cross, I'll let you kind of uh, stem off of that, but also just was 2018 the wake up call that Republicans really needed? And how did your efforts change from 2018 to 2020 to make sure that that didn't happen again? Yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt. And Gromer and I have talked about this very recently that 2018 was the wake up call. And I think that's why Republicans responded so well is because we didn't wake up Labor Day weekend of 2020 and say, man, we've got to get involved. Uh, it was November, whatever, of 2018. We said, if we don't get our act together, um, things are going to go very differently next cycle. And so um, I, I know for me, last time in 2018, I was helping friends out around the state, uh, how, how I can help them and make sure they came back. 2020, I said, what do I need to do to make sure I've got my house in order in uh, House District 93? So you're exactly right. 2018 was a huge wake up call. And uh, because of that, Republicans prepared and we responded and responded well on Tuesday night. I want to ask you about the Dallas area. I mean, Democrats have been on this steady march in Dallas for years. What happened this time around just when it comes to um, picking up more seats and what we saw with really kind of keeping the, the status quo? Um, this is for me, Karina. Garomer, yes. yes uh, <laughs> in 2018, I think Democrats got a lot of low hanging fruit and, 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 and Representative Krauss is, is right. They kind of caught Republicans by surprise. And, um, and, you know, Representative, former Representative Beto O'Rourke ran a really great campaign and raised $80 million. Um, it was sort of a different kind of race. This time around though, uh, I think going into the 2020 cycle, I mean, I, Democrats and, and, and the representative will probably tell you, knew that it would be tough getting to nine. Uh, but what happened was the polls and, and, and all the money coming in and their energy and excitement gave sort of the illusion that it was a done deal in some circles. And talking to Republicans, the, they were kind of uh, getting used to the fact that uh, Democrats would have a great night as well, particularly in terms of taking the House. Uh, 
But to ask to what happened, I mean, Morgan, Meyer, Angie, Tim Button, uh, Representative Krauss and everybody, all the five targeted seats in Tarrant County won, uh, and even in Collin County. And so what that shows you is, yeah, the Republicans were ready. Um, I, I think the, the polls were wrong and there was an under, it was underestimated how tough it would be, uh, even with the close races in 2018 to actually get from uh, uh, minus nine to, to plus whatever. Abby, at the end of the day, I mean, we're seeing um, Biden still or Trump still won by six points, which is a smaller margin than we've seen in decades. And as more of these mail-in ballots uh, came in for Texas, we actually saw Tarrant County then flip to Biden. So the landscape there, and, and even if these uh, House lawmakers and some congressional members are able to hang on to their seats, how do you think that changes moving forward and, and with what you saw on election night? I think there's going to be a lot more caution nationally with Texas, um, whether it's spending money um, and enthusiasm. I, I'm endlessly fascinated with Tarrant County. That is my home county. I grew up in Fort Worth. And if you, I, I just wouldn't have believed you if you told me that the county would flip as it appears to have for Joe Biden, but they wouldn't pick up any state rep seats. And I'm, I'm terribly interested what the, the representatives have to say about that. But um, I think when you're looking at this, and I'm in Washington right now, the chatter in national circles is th there were a number of Democratic incumbents across the country on the House who lost. And like in particular, one really hurt was a woman named Donna Shalala, Congresswoman of South Florida. And she used to be the um, secretary of HHS. Um, she's a very notable political figure long before she came to Congress and she lost. And um, I think there's some questions of why were Democrats so bullish on going on offense, particularly in Texas, and then they've taken all of these losses. And so there's a lot of consternation in national political circles. Um, everything that happened in Texas played out nationally, and it's it's just a scrambled, and I think that's a reflection of Donald Trump, has just completely upended all of the normal, I guess, laws of nature we used to apply to politics. Representative Cross, I want you to weigh in on that too, because I mean, this is your area and what you saw with the, the house races versus at the top of the ticket. Yeah, it, it really is fascinating. I was just looking at the numbers again today. And, and as Abby said, um, I think uh, Biden has about 12, 15, 1600 vote lead in Tarrant County, which is crazy. But you go right below that. John Cornyn won the county by about 41,000 votes. And you look at all the judges, you look at the Supreme Court judges, Court of Criminal Appeals, our local judges. Uh, and of course the state reps. Um, and each one of those statewide, countywide races, the Republicans still hold about a 41,000 vote margin in that area. So um, did Tarrant turn blue for purposes of the presidential election? Possibly, uh, or it looks like it's going to, but for all the down ballot things, the Republicans again showed their strength and 41,000 is a pretty healthy margin uh, in our county. And um, as people were talking about, Donald Trump's a unique figure. People love him, people hate him but that there can be a uh, about a 42,000 delta between Biden and Cornyn in Tarrant County is just fascinating to me. And Karina, let me just add though, uh, Beto won Tarrant County in 2018, I believe, which gave fuel to Democrats uh, coming into uh, 2020. So something is happening at the top, right? Uh, that isn't translating in the, in the down ballot races for whatever reason, and maybe it's message candidates, whatever, but there's something going on there. It's fascinating. Well, Gormer, let me, yeah, go ahead, Representative Israel. I'll lay in here and say one of the things we can say, you know, from two years ago is we had a, we had a big gap between Republicans and Democrats in the House. And one of the reasons why the gap was so big is because Democrats weren't able to tell their story. Telling your story costs money. Uh, direct mail, digital ads, and TV. Well, that was all in place this time around. Um, but the Trump factor is is the is is the is the weird thing that was I think throwing the polls off. So it, we had three house races that were um, lost by less than one percent. We had seven house races that were lost by less than five percent. So what makes me feel good is that I and my Republican colleagues were held more accountable to a November vote. At the end of the day, that's a good thing. More than eleven million Texans voted. That's a good thing. Um, so, you know, we'll be digging into the data to see, to see what happened, but it, it, it tightened up, um, and, um, 
it, go back to you know the pollsters. You know, it's, it's just it still drives you drives you nuts that the data could be that far off. And we'll we'll see if that was a if this was a the year of Trump effect because he has so many he he brings so many weird um, points with him or or if this is a trend. Remember, I'll ask you about want to ask you about straight ticket voting. I mean, there this was the first election that we didn't have straight ticket voting. How much do you think that had an effect on down ballot candidates? But also with what Representative Israel is saying and the fact that yes, uh, incumbents may have kept their seats, Democrats may not have flipped their seats, but these were very close races. Yeah, I I think straight ticket voting, uh, the the elimination of it had to have it, an impact. It's hard to to really quantify, but when you look at the fact that, you know, someone going into Tarrant County or any any other place and, and voting for Trump or Biden, and and then a, a down ballot a candidate gets a, an automatic vote, I think that, that, that meant something, removing that. And what's hard to know is how many casual voters would come in and and see R or D and just vote the straight ticket. But I think that's a significant number. We'll, I don't know how significant, but but we'll 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 have to see. Uh, but the bottom line is, yeah, I mean, a lot of you know a lot of the viewers and and readers they see that the Republicans won and think it's just you know they just rolled out the ball and and just had an easy win. It's not like that. I. I think what's getting lost here is that Texas may not be a, a battleground in a sense of a presidential battleground where you see presidential candidates invest time and money here, but it's a competitive state. And if you don't work hard to win, you will lose. And I think Representative Krause will tell you that. I mean, if, if, if those Republican candidates, down ballot candidates didn't have money and didn't work hard, the Democrats would have beat them. And, the, the other part too is message and and we'll see that I still think this is a center right state and if a Democrat is going to win their message probably has to be center left. Uh, I, I let, let's see uh, Representative Israel if she can speak to that but I think that that message is important but it's not easy for Republicans anymore. This is going to be a battle a, a competitive state from here on out. Representative Cross, I'm interested to hear your take because, I mean, Republicans were the ones that did away with straight ticket voting, but do you think that that would have hurt you had it been there this time around? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we got rid of it in 2017, and I think it definitely hurt us, uh, but we said it's going to take effect 2020. It, I think it definitely hurt us in 2018, for sure. Uh, I think everybody agrees that with the Beto mania, the Beto effect, there's a lot of folks that went in there, hit Beto, went all the way down, and that had a huge effect. This time, I mean, you had people, at least 40 some thousand people in Tarrant County who voted for Biden and then voted for Corn. And so I don't know if it was maybe they were going to do that anyway and you weren't going to have as many straight ticket votes. Um, as Gromer said, we really don't know. Uh, I'm waiting for Derek Ryan to uh, crunch all the numbers and get back to us uh, on what it means. But uh, it, it could have had a huge effect. It may not have. But I, as, um, as Representative Israel said and others have said, the fact that it makes voters more engaged and have to go down the ballot and actually come out to vote to go down that ballot, I think is a is a positive thing. Derek Ryan's been a busy man. Um, <laughs> Abby, I, I know since you're in Washington, I want to kind of shift the conversation just a, a little bit to you and what type of influence you think Texas will have in Congress. I mean, was there an expectation in D.C. that at least a couple of Texas seats would flip? Absolutely. I, I think um, and I shared this this analysis at least two seats of the many that Democrats were targeting would probably flip and obviously none did. Um, again, it's very status quo. Um, Texas is in a, in a transition period in Congress and it's actually not related to who wins or who loses partisan wise. It's because House Republicans have a rule that you can only be a chairman for six years or ranking member. And so that's what had has fueled a lot of these retirements that had been nicknamed Texas, where members who'd been at the top of their committees and looked around and said, you know what, I don't want to go back to being rank and file. So there is a, there are a lot of folks over the last four years who phased out of Congress. And so we have a very increasingly young delegation. 
Um, not a lot of seniority, not a lot of know-how, but I do think that that is also a good thing. There's some new energy, new perspective in both parties, and things have just kind of freshened up and livened up again. So there's trade-offs, but um, I think that, and I think we should, um, and I don't have a strong sense right now, but who does Joe Biden appoint to his um, administration and our Texans in the mix? And I think it'll be an interesting few months. Representative Israel, are you worried that flipping the Texas House will be even more difficult in 2022 um, with President Biden as President Biden elect um, in those midterm elections? Well, I don't know what to make of it. I'm um, my, my head is really just full of what we've just been through. I, I spent my last few days calling candidates to congratulate them, as I called my colleague, Rip Krause, and I called candidates to say, I'm sorry, it didn't work out. Um, so right now, we're not really thinking about that. We're, my staff and I visited this morning about legislation. Today's the first day of filing. Who are going to be our allies? Who can help us pass uh, common sense reform? So um, I'm really not thinking about that yet, Karina. I'm, I'm, I'm focused on what you might think is a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> and uh, getting through the day, reading, reading what other smart people have to say. And, um, and respecting the traditions of the House, which we make sure that we're not Congress, that we want to be able to work together and, and get things done. And perhaps at the end of the day, the voters in Texas were the big winner. Over 11 million voters, many of them um, making a statement uh, on, on these House races and, um, and saying, we, we, we do want you to get things done. And I, and I hope that that's ultimately, we, we will continue the traditions of, of the House and um, and not be Congress, and that's that's been that's been my my focus um, starting this morning. It's a, new, it's a new week, it's a new day. Let's get ready for session. Representative Cross, I mean, how will governing and the way you approach your job be different in a post-Trump world? Uh, I would like to say not different. Um, I've tried to be very consistent the last four years and say, hey, if the president does something good, uh, we should praise him for it. If the president does something wrong or steps out, we ought to call him uh, to account and you know make sure that he's, he's accountable. And so uh, I think that's the best approach to take with any elected official, to be honest with you. I've tried to be consistent with that. So uh, for me personally, I hope it's not much different. Um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, President Trump is, is a unique political figure. I don't know if we've seen anybody like him. And so um, I, think, I think there will be a little bit of a, a recalibration uh, at, at some point. And so, but it, it's hard to tell at this point. But uh, as Representative Israel says, we, we are focused on getting through this 2021 session with the things we have going on. Uh, it's going to be a tough session in a lot of ways, and we're all going to have to pull together and work together. Um, so no matter what's going on at the, at the national level, if there's dysfunction, if it's perfect, if it's harmonious, Texas has a lot of work to do in itself, and we need to make sure we're focused on those efforts. I want to ask you guys more about the Texas House in just a second. Gromer, I would just wanted you to weigh in on um, with what we're seeing in, in this transition, maybe or maybe not right now, but um, the way things will work here in Texas versus the way things will work in Washington and how you see that playing out with a, a President Biden. And I know we're still waiting to see what the U.S. Senate and what happens there, but how that trickles down. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think Texas sort of uh, reverts back to, to being, um, you know, Trump was such a powerful force in, in national politics, but also Texas politics. I think it kind of goes back to while Trump will, I don't think he's going any, anywhere uh, uh, in terms of party politics, but I do think you'll see the focus shift more on, on Governor Abbott and, and sort of the local Texas leaders. And, and I expect Abbott and Patrick and the Republican leadership to use Biden as, 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 a, as a boogeyman of sorts, a, a, a whipping uh, person. They will treat him the same way they treated Barack Obama when he was president. They will point to him and say, watch out for this guy. Uh, he doesn't represent Texas values and use him as a sort of a, a political prop for 2022. And it's a midterm year. Uh, Democrats uh, would, uh, by virtue of having a White House, will be the party in power. And so they will have to look out for sort of that backlash vote that you saw in 2010. I think that's the big challenge for Democrats is try, to try to not get overwhelmed by sort of a, a, a Republican tie uh, during a midterm year. But 
that's uh, that that would be the change not so much trump but more of a texas flavored uh you know sort of vibe going into 2022 abby uh, then attorney general uh, Greg Abbott used to say during the Obama administration, I like to wake up through the Obama administration and go about my day. I'm not quoting that correctly, but <laughs> how do you see this all playing out from the DC perspective on down to Texas? Well, I think what DC folks are going to increasingly become obsessed with um, in the legislative session is redistricting. And do Republicans choose, Texas and reapportionment is expected to get two to three seats. And do Republicans choose to be super aggressive and get as many seats as they possibly can in both the state ledge and the US House? Um, or do they maybe take a more conservative, and I'm not speaking ideologically, like strategically conservative approach, focus on incumbent protection? Um, my sense among talking to Republicans in the state, everybody wants as much rural landscape into their district as possible. And so there's a real choice ahead strategically because what happens sometimes um, in states, if they're super, super aggressive, by the end of the, de the decade, it's almost like Etch-a-Sketch. You shake the map up and those lines become less reliable on determining the winner. Um, and and because pe populations come in, people have moved around. Um, and so what kind of path do they take there? That was the root cause of why there was so much fascination with Texas was because of redistricting. Democrats thought that there was maybe a lot of ground to gain um, to bolster their what is increasingly looking like very thin majority in the U.S. House. So I think that's the central focus. But I think bigger than that, I think eyes will be on Texas in a way um, just it is the second largest state. It is like California. They, th those states always have outsized influence. And um, because the state House of Representatives held, um, there will probably be some legislation there that will make it to the new Supreme Court um, that could be very interesting in the future. Representative Israel, Abby had a good transition there, segue to redistricting. Uh, let's talk redistricting. And you and uh, Representative Cross can get into a back and forth on this and let yourselves go. <laughs> How do you see this playing out for uh, Democrats, um, given the fact that you obviously will not have the majority, um, but it is a, a close margin there? Yeah. Well, that was the, the big, the, the lost opportunity this session was to have um, a house, uh, house drawn map that reflected the true demographic trends that, that have been happening. But on the other hand, you can only do so much. The, the numbers are real. Uh, we are a very diverse day. It's, it's, it's beautifully diverse. And, um, you know, you, you can only, you have to apportion, you have to be equal, you have to be fair. And ultimately this always ends up in the courts. So um we'll see who who is chair of redistricting under um under the next speaker that's going to be important because that person needs to be a good partner with all the colleagues in the house and and with the senate and uh so i don't i don't really know what's going to happen i've never been through a redistricting session but my my colleagues who are more senior than i tell me that 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 takes up the oxygen in the room and that becomes the thing aside from the budget so it may not be as productive on other uh, on other legislative um, remedies. I hope that's not the case because we have a lot to do in regards to uh, criminal justice reform and um, um, other, uh, just other, other issues, elections reform, pandemic response. So, but I think the, the window is going to be very narrow. So I, I, I don't know, Karina, we've never, we've never been in this position before, but you can only do so much. And the, the demographic, we've been adding a thousand people a day now. And in my district, for example, it's high growth, high tech, and a ton of um, Asian Americans, African Americans who cannot afford to live in, in central Austin and cash out and buy the house at, at the edge of the county. And uh, that's happening all around the state. So we are, we are, um, we are a patchwork now of the state. Not, we're not predictable in any, in any one, in any one region. Representative Krauss, I mean, this will be your first time to do redistricting as well. Um, a lot of lawmakers in there, there, there will be some who are back, but how do you see this process playing out with a Republican controlled Senate, with a Republican controlled House and, and the role that Democrats will play in this? Yeah, I, I think it's gonna be fascinating. As you said, this will be my first redistricting session. I came in in 2013, 
seniority wise, I think I'll be right around number 44, number 45 in the house uh, coming into this session, which is crazy, which means only about 43 people in that chamber have gone through a redistricting session. And so uh, we'll have to rely pretty heavily on them. I was on the redistricting committee last session and we had already done about 13 field hearings uh, all around the state before COVID kind of shut that down. And so uh, we started to get an idea of where the growth was in the state, where uh, populations were shrinking, where we were going to have to do some work. Uh, Phil King did an amazing job as the chair of that committee. I, I would be surprised if he's probably not the chair of that committee going forward, just because he's already put so much time, effort, energy into it. And he's been one of those members who's been around enough to see a couple of redistricting cycles. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to meet a lot of congressmen and women uh, that I've never met before because they say they're down at the Capitol all the time. Uh, but I, I, it's something uh, that I've been told it's not just Republicans versus Democrats. It's intra-party struggles as well, especially in some of those urban areas um, where, you know, are you going to get paired? Uh, where, where are you going to be? And so I think that'll be fascinating as well. Uh, not just R versus D, but R versus R and D versus D as you kind of have to apportion. And as Representative Israel said, having so many new people come in, my, my area in Tarrant County is the fastest growing district. And so we're going to have to make changes. Um, and so what that looks like, we don't know. And uh, it, it'll, it'll be a fascinating process, but I'm an optimist and Texas has always done a good job of rising to the challenge and even on redistricting, it'll be tough. But I have uh, faith in my colleagues. I have faith in the Senate that, that we're going to get it done. And uh, if, if possible, draw maps that won't go to court, but uh, I, I wouldn't put money on that. So Merle, you weigh in on just the, the messy process that is redistricting and <laughs> how you think this will be any less messy or more messy. Well, I, I think there will be a lot of incumbency protection. The incumbents uh, will, I, they're, they're significant in the process because their first, generally their first role is to protect you know, their boundaries or make their boundaries best for them. The other question is, and this came up, I think Abby brought this up, how greedy will Republicans get? Uh, if you look in Dallas County, uh, they, in 2010, at the beginning of the cycle, drew all these, drew these lines to maximize Republican representation. By the end of the decade, they had lost, what, four or five seats, maybe more. Now there are only two Republicans left in Dallas County, Morgan Meyer and Angie Chin Button. So in other places, say like Tarrant County, for instance, where you see a lot of population growth, will they draw lines to fortify um, Republicans or will existing incumbents or will they kind of get greedy and try to, you know, add a few more seats here and there? I think that's a big question. And, and Representative Kraus brought up the legal challenges. That's always, uh, significant. Uh, the Section 5 provisions in the Voter, Voters' Rights Act no longer exist, where you need pre-clearance. And so we may still have some court cases going on with previous maps. Uh, so whether, whether, whether these maps hold up the smell test in terms of discrimination, discriminating against uh, uh, voters of color, that's going to be something that we watch as well, because Texas the maps always end up in court, always. Representative Krause, the chairman of the Texas GOP today, Alan West saying that Representative Phelan, um, the presumed speaker of the house who says that he has the votes to do that is a traitor and that the party won't accept or support him. Do you accept and support him? <laughs> Yeah, traitor's a pretty strong word um, for a guy who's, who's done a lot of things that uh, are in the Republican platform in his time. I mean, he was the guy who authored the uh, constitutional carry during a disaster uh, last session, which is about as far uh, as we've moved on Second Amendment rights uh, since I've been in the chamber. Um, but uh, yes, I, I think Re Representative Phelan still has the support of the Republican caucus as, as well as the entire uh, body. Uh, to become the next speaker. And so um, I, I'm happy to talk with anybody in our caucus and our grassroots who, who has concerns or uh, who has issues with uh, what a speakership under date feeling might be. I think he would do a really good job. Uh, I think he would be hardworking. I think he'd be transparent. Um, he's shown that in his time in the House. And so, yes, I, I support Dave Phelan. I know a lot of my colleagues, I think most, most all of us uh, at this point do, um, and, but again, I'm always happy to talk to you. You never want to just dismiss the people in your party who have uh, disagreements. You always want to talk to them 
um, see where maybe you're wrong, uh, wh where maybe you can inform them in other places. So I look forward to having those conversations with uh, Chairman West or anybody else who wants to have those in, in the coming months. But I do think Dave Phelan on day one, January 12th, will have the gavel in his hand and, and be our next speaker. Representative Israel, I mean, what do you want to see from a speaker feeling if that is indeed, in fact, the way it ends up? I mean, I know he's been an ally of um, Speaker Bonin, the outgoing speaker. Do you think he needs to show that he's different from Bonin? Well, I think um, Rep, I, I support Rep Phelan. Uh, I expect him to be the next Speaker of the House. I, 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 it is disappointing to see the, the once, once it was a once the decision is done, like we got to move forward. Transition, just as you see in the White House is important. Transition to the speaker level is equally important. We've got to prepare for a session where we'll have, where we have um, COVID concerns, healthcare concerns. Um, and uh, you always want to make sure that the speaker is surrounded by really smart policy people who are a liaison to my office to help us all be better representatives. But I've, I've gotten the assurance from um, Chair Phelan that he believes that he believes in what I believe in, and that the speaker should help every member succeed to the extent that they want to succeed. Um, and if you want to sit on the in the back rail and and pout, you can. <laughs> but if you want to get in there and get some stuff done, uh, that lane is open. So I'm I'm assured that that's the case. A lot of what we work on is 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 nonpartisan, and and if you're smart, you work across party lines to say, I've got this support on both sides. Can I get a hearing? Can I get out of hearing and move it through? So, for that reason, I I, I have I have um, high expectations of Rep. Beelan, but I'm assured that he and I share those same goals. Um, I'll ask this question to all of you. Um, it's just kind of a, a general one about the um, state of the next legislative session. But Gormor, maybe I'll start with you. I mean, everyone's still having to deal with the the coronavirus pandemic. There's still many Texans who are unemployed. Um, I know that during the course of this campaign, and I know Representative Israel, we've talked about this on, on my program, but um, there's been some change in the conversation about Medicaid expansion and whether more Republicans will look to that uh, because of the coronavirus pandemic. How do you see that conversation playing out in the next legislative session? And do you see it as, as more of a bipartisan approach? I Armour, if you want to start, yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, the pandemic will be, of course, the major topic, and and in, inside that topic is is healthcare. When you think about 2018 and and to some degree 2020, healthcare has been really uh, a major issue and an issue that Democrats have been able to to really gain traction on uh, because voters respond to it. I mean, a lot of the gains in 2018 on a congressional level and on a state level were because of, in my opinion, the, the health care issue. And I think that will bring Republicans to the table. You mentioned Medicaid expansion except the federal deal. Let's say even if they don't do that, there has to be a conversation on what the Texas solution is to, to get more people uh, affordable health insurance. So yes, I think that will be a big issue. And I think the, the voters in, in essence, have pushed Republicans to the table on this. Abby, I'll let you weigh in. Well, I, I can't speak too much to the legislature. I'm just not well sourced enough on that front. But what I can say is coronavirus is going to be the dominating issue that Congress takes up. Um, I think it's also going to be a fascinating display. We have um, three pretty elderly people running the presidency, the Senate, assuming the Republicans hold the Senate. And uh, the U.S. House, and they're all deal makers. Um, and so I think you're going to have a lot of clashing priorities. And Nancy Pelosi is very weakened going into the session, given how many seats she lost. There may be a chance that if seven Democrats band together, they can kill any legislation she's trying to move through there, whether it's not conservative, if it's too conservative or not liberal enough or um, along those lines. And so um, I, I but I think coronavirus is going to be a dominating issue. And, you know, I, my hope is that these folks all know each other and hopefully we'll be able to negotiate in a productive way. Representative Cross, what's your take on just the idea of some bipartisan movement on Medicaid expansion or um, some of these other healthcare issues dealing with the coronavirus and that being um, the key issue next session? 
Yeah, that, again, it, it is going to be the key issue. And it's not just at the broader level of policy. It's at the uh, lower level of just how are we going to get our jobs done, right? Uh, there's questions. Do we meet in the chamber? Do we have in-person committee hearings? Do we do certain things in a different way? And so uh, that that's all COVID related as well. And I, I, I'll continue to say, and I hope Representative Israel agrees with me, uh, that if we're in session, we need to be in the people's house and uh, we need to be present. Uh, teachers are sent into the classroom every day. Healthcare workers are sent into uh, hospitals every day. Everybody is going to their jobs. And so we need to be at our job as well. Um, so we'll have to do that. On, on the healthcare front, I, I think Gromer's right. I, I think there were a lot of strides gained in 2018 on that issue. And I think you saw last session, Republicans respond to that. Um, Senator Kelly Hancock and Representative Tom Oliverson had a bill uh, last session that created a high risk insurance pool so that people didn't have to worry about pre-existing conditions here in Texas um, should they not have an insurance uh, provider that could, could do that for them. So Texas was proactive. We worked at that uh, to make sure those with pre-existing conditions were still covered. And I think that's the kind of ingenuity and kind of uh, bipartisan cooperation. We're gonna look for solutions, as Gromer said, to Texas specific stuff, whether uh, whatever it is, we're going to be looking for those uh, issues and, and not looking to Washington DC to save us on them. Representative Israel, what's your take on this? Because I know that there's been plenty of criticism about what Representative Matt Cross is talking about with regards to that bill from Democrats. Well, I was uh, heartened to see this summer um, another conservative state who expanded Medicaid, and now Texas is in the minority of states that said no to those federal dollars. Um, Missouri passed uh, an initiative that was similar to, to my bill, which is if the body doesn't want to make a decision on it, take it to the voters. And it's happened, I think, in Idaho and Utah, and most recently in Missouri, where they said, let's expand Medicaid, and you can have your own your own version of what that looks like, but I think it's I, I think it's malpractice to put a medical term on it. It's malpractice to not take back your federal dollars to help Texans have more insurance so that their insurance isn't tied to their job at a time when, the, when those jobs are untenable and uh, on shaky ground. We, we, have a, we have a conservative model and, uh, and that comes in the form of various conservative states that have done it. And we continue to lose rural hospitals left and right. So um, uh, I'm Rep Representative Busey and I have um, an initiative that would just simply say, let's, let's follow the Missouri model and take it to the voters. The, the, the Appropriations Committee will be key to that on our side to see what, what does that solution look like? What's our skin in the game to pull down those federal dollars? But we've seen several, several um, of my Republican friends who are open to, to new ideas. And um, I think the voters have spoken on that issue in particular. I'm gonna to get to some questions from the participants now. I'll try to get to all of these, but um, Representative Cross, I'll start with you on this one. Is this very Zoom related and virtual related? Uh, assuming the Capitol remains closed during session, how effective do you think Zoom meetings will be for constituents? I work for a trade association and normally we host an advocacy event in February. I worry about Zoom fatigue from both lawmakers and constituents. <laughs> yeah, God bless you. I feel that Zoom fatigue uh, right <laughs> now before session even starts. And so uh, again, I'm gonna go back to, I, I think the Capitol should be open. Uh, you might have to limit how many people can be in a committee room at a time. You might have to limit certain things, but I, I wanna hear those trade association days, and I'm sure Representative Israel would agree with me, are some of my favorite days, because we are hearing from constituents um, about the issues that are important to them. So we're gonna do our best to keep our office open the entire session. Uh, I, I do think uh, members offices are everyone's a little unique. Some are older, some may have health conditions where they may make different decisions than I will in my office. I think you have to allow that. But I think we do need to meet in person. I think the Capitol needs to be open for the people to express themselves and uh, and petition their government. Uh, we work for them. They don't work for us. And so uh, I'm hoping the Capitol is open business as usual as much as possible. And, and we'll be having those interactions where we can really hear from constituents and have real meaningful conversations. Zoom is gonna be okay in some uh, instances if you have to have invited testimony or special circumstances, but I think that should be the exception, not the rule. It has not been easy from a TV news standpoint, I'll tell you that. <laughs> as good as all of you gotten with your uh, uh, backgrounds and everything else. Um, Representative Israel, I mean, have you heard anything about where or how the session might look, where it might take place? Um, no. What's your take on this? No, that, that goes to my point. I think it was really important for us to decide on the speaker apparent quickly 
because uh, he and his team have to work quickly to uh, with our House Administrative Committee, chaired by Charlie Guerin. Um, here in Central Texas, Donna Howard is on that committee. Uh, she's a former critical care nurse. Um, and just as a reminder, the 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 bulk of the work that happens is underground, so it's it's not really conducive to airflow. Um, although it was a, a an architectural wonder when it was built, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, so we've we've got to come up with with some happy medium here. But we are all very concerned about visitors in small spaces um, and uh, and just being careful. We don't want to do more harm in the course of doing the people's business. But it is the people's house. Um, we just might not have all those, uh, you know, Boy Scouts with uh, germy hands running all over the place. But uh, we, I still want people to come and, and, and do what they need to do and visit. That It makes a difference when you visit in person. I know when we passed um, um, cannabinoid oil, for example, meeting my constituent who was in a motorized wheelchair to tell me her story and to know that she was my constituent. Uh, she didn't care if I was Republican or Democrat. She just wanted she wanted me to feel her story and, and her kids' story, and I did. So that's an example. And other safety-related issues that I hear about in the transportation committee, um, when people can tell you their story in person, it 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 makes a difference. So I I hope that we can find a way to make that happen. Abby, I've got a, another question. I'll call this person out, Jennifer Sarver. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> as, a, as a native of the Rio Grande Valley, I was fascinated by the results in South Texas and the growth in Trump's share of the Hispanic vote. Can you comment on that? That was one of the questions that I did not get to, so I'm glad she asked it. Well, I think that, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, Go ahead, Abby. I'll, I'll say something in the okay, Navigator. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I will say, I mean, I, the, we, the Democrats got an overwhelming majority of the Latino vote in areas that were not in the valley. In all the other urban areas of Texas, the Latino vote came out strongly Democrat. Um, but that tells you we shouldn't take the Latino vote for granted. And there's members who have been redistricted into a strong, comfortable Democratic position. And um, they need to tell their story, too. Uh, we all were taking a victory lap for the public school money that, that the public support funding that we put out there. And um, that's, that's another dynamic. Um, I think in South Texas, you have the energy sector that would weigh into it. Um, border issues weigh heavily. We don't agree on, on all of that stuff. Um, and um, there, were, there were a lot of lies being told about Democrats that we, that we supported defunding the police, for example, which is incorrect. Now, at the end of the day, I'm I'm a small business person, Chamber of Commerce Democrat, who happens to be a lesbian from El Paso, Texas. Uh, so I, I have a lot of different layers to me, and I re represent a high growth, diverse district in Texas. Very proud of my border background. So I, I think that what happened in the border was um, was disappointing, but uh, it, it should be a wake up call for for Latinos and and progressives and Republicans alike. You can't take that vote for granted. Abby, I'll let you weigh in. I know you guys have written a lot about this and has, has Gromer. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be something I think will be studied for years and years, both by journalists, by political actors, by academics. Um, I, one thing I would flag, um, for as much criticism as uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton got for her 2016 campaign, um, she, did, she did better than Biden, if I recall, in South Texas. And she, had she and Bill Clinton have ties going back to 1972 in that region for the McGovern campaign. Um, and this is a region both of them cared about. So if you had told me that Joe Biden would underperform Hillary Clinton in South Texas, it wouldn't have shocked me. What shocked me was that one of the congressmen down there, Congressman Vicente Gonzalez, who's based in McAllen and his district goes north, um, he, he won, I think, by three points. I haven't seen the final margin, but there was a moment in the middle of the night, I thought he might lose. And that was one of the things, I felt like something strange was gonna happen. And I was worried the polls were wrong um, just because there were so many new people coming out, but that is not what I was looking for. And I was completely stunned with that. And so when Democrat, national Democrats are looking at Texas before they can go on the offensive, they have to worry about protecting him before anything else. And so it's gonna be very fascinating. Gurma, here's another question. Um, given the closeness of various down ballot races, would results for Democrats have been better if Biden had spent one or more days campaigning in major Texas cities like San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas? Um, 
Yes and no. I, I think a presidential, well, presidential candidate visits always help. You saw with Trump how uh, it, his whirlwind campaign uh, tour of uh, Pennsylvania and Michigan and all those states, I think helped tighten things. And so a Biden visit here uh, strategically probably would have helped, maybe even more so than, than money because the airwaves were so saturated uh, toward the end. And I don't know that that matters, but but yeah, I, I think it, it helped, would it would, it, but it probably wouldn't have given him a victory here. I think the numbers just suggest that this is still a Republican leaning state. And so you, you really, really have to do a whole lot uh, to flip it uh, statewide, uh, particularly with Trump having that hidden strength that I think a lot of people underestimated. But could he have done more to pump up uh, even African American, even black voters, uh, which I, I, look, they perform very well, but there's always meat left on the bone. There's always something, uh, uh, areas in the state that you can look at where you say, wow. Uh, and, and this happened with Beto O'Rourke. I wish I could have pumped up those numbers a little bit more. So a visit would have helped. Would he have won Texas by coming here more? I don't think so. Representative Krauss, um, what's the current situation with the state budget? Are we still anticipating major cuts in the next session? Good luck with that one. <laughs> yes, um, but you know, that, that's the big question. Uh, Representative Israel and I, when we get sworn in, we only have one constitutional duty for 140 days and that's to pass a budget, a balanced budget. And so um, I know I've been in a, in a lot of talks with uh, the appropriations chair, Giovanni Capriglione up here in South Lake. Um, who my guess will continue to be the uh, appropriations chair. And, and, and he says it, it's going to be tough. I mean, we're going to have a tough session to figure out how to fund all of our priorities with the money we have because of COVID related um, uh, environment and, and what happened with oil and gas a few months back. And so uh, it was kind of a perfect storm of uh, economic maladies, um, you could say, it, that, that's going to put us in this position. And so it's going to be tough. But again, the optimist in me says we will come together. We'll figure out a way to fund those things that we need to. Um, and, and, and we've always done that. And we have to do that. And, and we will do that, even though it's going to be tough. Have there been any talks yet about uh, additional revenue? Uh, well, there's been a lot of talks uh, about everything you can think of. I, I think everybody's looking um, at, at any way we can do this. I know the rainy day fund uh, has been talked about quite a bit. You don't always have that going into session, um, but I think everybody understands that if this isn't a rainy day, what is? And so I think you'll be looking at some ways to use uh, that economic stabilization fund uh, to shore up some of our uh, shortfalls. And and, and luckily, we have that money and, and we haven't touched it in the past uh, for other causes so that we do have that now. So I think you'll see that and then other ways to, to try to figure out that budget shortfall. But there are going to be some hard conversations, um, although I've had a few veteran lawmakers that say session sometimes is easier when you don't have money. When you do, everybody comes to you and it's hard to say no. When you don't have money, you can just tell them, sorry, we don't have it. Uh, you're not going to get it and uh, just just get ready for a tough session. So we'll see how it goes. But um, but we'll get there. Representative Israel, what do, what do Democrats fight hardest for in terms of not cutting some of these? I mean, there was so much money pumped into education last time around and various other uh, areas. Well, I think we fight we fight hardest to uh, for public education because that is our future economic reality. If we want to if we want to continue to lead, continue to grow and innovate um, and do cool stuff. Uh, with our with our business with our business world, we've got to make sure that there's a pipeline there, and uh, uh, so that's going to be, I think, the big the big area for us is um, how how do we maintain the revenue that, that we put in? Because in the last economic recession, we cut public education by 5.4 billion dollars, and that that left um, that did real real harm and real damage. You layer on top of that, of course, the COVID environment where teachers are um, so, and some districts are have some kids are distance learning and some kids are in the classroom. I know I couldn't do that. Um, so there's a there's even more challenges and then internet access. So there's a lot of a lot of things that we're all having to to learn about the intricacies of, of how do you teach a kid. And uh, I think that's got to be our number one um, 
defense points. Um, I'll just ask you this too, and it's one of the questions, but how do you foresee new revenue streams in that battle um, in the next legislative session? Well, um, there's always, um, uh, there's always uh, corporate um, um, uh, gifts that, that the state government gives. And I think this is time for us to look at those array of incentives that the state has and see where can, where can we nip and tuck. It can't, that's not the only answer though. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to cut, it, cut some of our expectations. Some of our agencies are gonna have to cut expenses. Um, and some of our special interests are going to have to, to give in. Um, for example, there's a re retailers get a get a discount for submitting their sales taxes online. That's a that's a, a remnant from the 1980s when when you when you incentivize people to do their transactions electronically. Texas.gov is now doing millions of, of transactions uh, in dollars every week. So the the more that that's just one small example where why, why are we give, why are we letting them have a discount for what is a common sense business practice now? Um, but those are those are our budget uh, pennies compared to what, what we need. So it's got to be the where the rubber meets the road is the appropriations committee. That's where all of these details get hammered out, and uh, those folks have my complete respect because they start their day early and they go back and keep on hammering away at that budget, and that's. Uh, and our staffs have not been in contact with our appropriators. They haven't been having those regular meetings that we normally have during the interim. So there's that um, lack of information as during a time of pandemic. It's, it's unforeseen, unprecedented. And I know that we're all up for the challenge. Sarah, do we have time for one more? Absolutely. Okay. Um, this one keeps coming up. So. I don't know who wants to, I think it's probably directed towards you, Representative Israel, but others can weigh in too. Um, instead of defund the police, why didn't any of the Democrats consider reinvent public safety? You know, we were saying all kinds of things. The last thing we were saying was defund the police. Uh, so that's just a propaganda tag that stuck. And uh, there was, you know, dozens and dozens of direct mail pieces and TV ads that that, that, that came upon us. So um, the, we have to, we have to, we're going, I know we're all going to follow the lead of the Black Caucus. Um, they're talking about uh, criminal justice reform and reprioritizing how we support cities and counties. Um, so um, we can, we can quarterback it all you want, but the propaganda war was clearly won by, um, by my Republican friends who were misrepresenting Democratic um goals so I, I don't know what to tell you we can all we can all be marketing gurus but uh at the end of the day we no, no democrats were out there saying deep on the police we were trying to say what you just said in a different, in a different way it wasn't getting through Kramer, how much of an effect do you think that had on races i mean particularly we saw it in a lot of the state house races with the the governor asking people to sign the pledge of back the blue and that type of thing oh it had a tremendous effect I mean that, and 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 the fracking uh, question, the you know green energy, all those issues where Republicans were able to take and and formulate attack ads against Democrats and progressives. The t on the left end of the Democratic Party, progressives wouldn't really budge on that issue either. Uh, they kept saying defund. As that wasn't what most of the Democratic candidates would say. That's what wasn't what they were saying, but it didn't matter at that point. And I think at the top, uh, Biden was a little slow to kind of denounce that. I mean, it took a little while, uh, and by then it kind of got it got out of control. But yes, that that was devastating. I think for a lot of Democratic uh, Party candidates, who had to answer that question, and then uh, their their answers and and their positions were distorted. I mean, if you if you were a Democratic candidate and you just knew someone who who said defund the police or or just associated with a group that used that term, you were wrapped, you were pulled in there with them. So it was a tough issue for them. Abby, how much did that play into congressional races here in Texas? 
I mean, it was in a lot of television advertising. And I asked most of the Democratic challengers at one point or another, do you support defunding the police? And they all said no. But, you know, I saw it with my own eyes at protests in D.C., just signs that said defund the police and things like that. And I, we are seeing um, the, the House Democrats all had a conference call, which was supposed to be members only, but uh, reporters were managed to sneak into it. And a congresswoman who nearly lost in Virginia basically said this nearly cost me my seat. Stop using this kind of language. And I don't really think of too many official Democrats actually use that term. Um, and she said socialism as well. Um, but that it is being thrown around in the democratic progressive world, I think was hurtful. And um, she made that point, but she got a lot of pushback too from the left. So I, I think this is a symptom of a real fight brewing in national democratic politics. Representative Cross, I'll give you the final word on this. I mean, how much did this play into your uh, race? And I mean, do you think it's a, a fair term to use against a democratic opponent? Look at him smiling, Karina. He <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, it, it's hard to say that it's fabricated. You don't do it when you could see it play out in real time that $150 million was taken out of the Austin uh, Police Department and deployed to other places. And I think that was your your example of defund the police. I know uh, my opponent had had a fundraiser with Greg Kasar, the Austin City Councilman, uh, who, who was uh, endorsed by the Socialist Party, who embraced that uh, uh, that uh, label and also uh, almost kind of bragged that uh, he led the fight in Austin to take away that $150 million uh, from the Austin Police Department. And so uh, you did have uh, Representative Leach, his opponent had some very strong words about defunding the police as well. And so it wasn't all theoretical. It wasn't all marketing. There were some actual real world uh, applications and real world statements showing that that is the direction that some of our opponents could take things should they get in office. And so um, I do think it was effective. Uh, I, I think it was a, a misstep at the national level, as Gromer said, for uh, Biden not to come out more forcefully and, and put that to rest. But uh, on the local level, I think there were some legitimate instances of that. And, and uh, I think it uh, was a very positive for Republicans. I will just note that the Austin Police Department has not been defunded, though. There was money <laughs> taken and out reallocated other places. Um, but $150 million went away from uh, some of their critical work for other purposes. And so I think that's what allowed a lot of people to say that's what defunding would look like. But I, I understand your point. The, well. the terminal, yes. Um, well, let's leave it on, on that very <laughs> controversial note. <laughs> um, but thank you guys so much for doing all of this. I'll turn it back over to Eric. Well, thanks, thank you to the panel for sharing your insights with us this afternoon. We really appreciate all your time. Um, if you're not already yet a member of the Future Forum, I strongly encourage you to sign up on our website, lbjfutureforum.org. Uh, members enjoy the best of what the Future Forum has to offer, including first access to events and happy hours, networking opportunities, and benefits at the LBJ Presidential Library. Our next event will be on December 10th, where we'll explore the impact of COVID-19 on higher education. Thank you all, and I hope to see you again. <laughs>